OK, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do is talk with webmasters and publishers, like the ones here in the Hangout, the ones that submitted lots of questions, uh, people in the forum as well. And looks like we have a bunch of people here already. Um, as always, if any of you want to get started with a question, feel free to jump on in now. I'll, I'll ask a question. OK. Uh, in, in the UK, we have two brands, and we're going to merge them. And so we, we're going to uh, do a site move in 301. Do we, do we need a disavow file at both after the move, or just the new one, since the old one will probably be ignored? Just the new one. So basically, just where the links go in the end, where they get redirected to, that's where you need the disavow. Okay, I thought so. Okay. Uh, I have an issue with uh, uh, my automotive publisher uh, from the United States. He's in uh, Google News. I'm not sure if you're the best person to ask, but I tried to form them. Uh, they said this is an issue. Uh, so in Webmaster Tools and Search Console, I see that the site, the news site map reports unknown news site for the past two weeks. Yet in the partner dashboard, publisher center, Google News publisher center, everything seems OK. It's verified. The website is included. But uh, the news the news site map still shows. I tried recently it did, and still shows errors that the URL is not in the uh, uh, news website or something like that. I'd go through the news contact form there. So within the Help Center, if you search for something like Contact Google News, you, have, you can go to the contact form. And uh, there, you should be able to submit that and have someone take a look at that. OK, OK. So uh, I tried to pull out form. So you say this would be a better option. Yeah, I mean, what, what we've sometimes seen is that uh, the Google News, in the Google News site, you have to specify the publisher name, I think. And we've sometimes seen sites have like a typo in there or a slightly different version of the name than we have in our database, and that confuses things a bit. Right. Well, it worked. We didn't change anything, and it worked fine up until weeks ago, something like that. And uh, somebody from the product forum, a top contributor, told me it's a known issue and they don't have any uh, workaround at the moment or fix or something like that. So I thought maybe you might know that. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm meeting some folks from the Google News team next week. If you want to send me a link, I can pass that on to them as well. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. All right. Uh, let's go through some of the submitted questions. And we can see how far we go. And we'll probably have time for questions and answers in between as well. Um, how can you increase domain authority of your website without link building? Is there any other techniques we can use? We recovered from a manual penalty due to unnatural links. So we're very reluctant to let an SEO agency use this method. What do you recommend? So I, I think the first aspect here is that domain authority isn't something that we define on our side. So I don't really know what goes into this kind of arbitrary metric that you call domain authority. Then. So I can't really help you with what you need to do to change that. And uh, from my point of view, if you just recovered from an un a manual action from links that were built, then I really wouldn't recommend just going off to build links unnaturally again, because you just kind of slide into that again. And that's probably not uh, in your best interest. Uh, for some reason, Googlebot spiders and creates URLs from our e-commerce site that we didn't create. We are forever setting 301s. Uh, can it damage our rankings if we have too many 301s? And if so, should some, we do something different? Um, so too many 301s shouldn't be a problem. Um, in general, what happens is we follow up to five 301s in a row. And then if we can't reach the destination page, then we'll try again in the next time. So that's something that, that does have an effect on how we crawl. But if you're talking about too many 301s and that you have too many individual pages that just 
301 ones to a final page, then that's definitely not a problem. However, um, if you're saying that Googlebot is crawling URLs that you didn't create, then my guess is that something within your website is set up incorrectly, that maybe you have some relative links somewhere that are pointing at URLs that you didn't know about, where maybe the rewriting that you're doing on the server side creates kind of this infinite structure where we can go down, down, down through different uh, levels and folders and keep getting the same content. And that's something that you should ideally clean up, because what happens there is we get kind of lost with all of this crawling. And even if there are 301s for the kind of the, the, the individual URLs there, we kind of get lost crawling all of these unnecessary URLs. And we might not be able to crawl and index your new and updated content as quickly as we could otherwise. So that's something I try to figure out where that's coming from. There are a number of crawlers out there that you can use to kind of crawl your website on your own. Uh, Screaming Frog is a, is a really popular one. There's also Xeno's Links Loop, which is a, a Windows app, I think, that you can just run across your website to see where it goes, how far it goes, where it finds which URLs. And ideally, yeah, yeah. I recommend cleaning that up. Yeah, John, uh, actually regarding this uh, 301, uh, there was a query from me. <coughs> uh, John, when yes. I redirect one page, yeah, John, when I, re I redirect one page to another page, Google always says that please redirect 301 or 302 in relevant page. Okay. That's, so, what does it say? So, I'm sorry, I, I uh, missed that. Uh, so that part. Yeah, uh, uh, Google always suggests that please redirect your uh, relevant pages to relevant page. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, does Google before uh, passing its uh, value to another page really consider that really this page was relevant to this page, and this is why you say that uh, please uh, uh, redirect only to relevant page or just uh, with the help of 301, you pass the, the value and do not consider uh, whether it, this page was relevant or not. Um, we don't blindly treat redirects as, as clear redirects, because sometimes there are situations that it's a temporary issue, or sometimes it's a situation that the whole website is redirecting to one URL, and actually that's more like a 404. So we do try to understand what, what's happening in the bigger picture for the website with these redirects. And if these are just individual pages that are being redirected, then that's perfectly fine. But if you're using 301 redirects as a way to clean up a site instead of a 404, then we would probably treat that just as a 404. So we, we do try to take a little bit uh, more look directly at what's actually happening and don't blindly trust everything that we see. So John, can you okay. clarify something you said there? You maybe I'm maybe you did at the end there, but you said that um, if there's too many pages being 301, you might consider it a 404. Does that do you mean just within a site if someone's trying to use that as a tool? To, oh yeah, yeah. Not, so, not within official site movement section and doing it in webmaster tools. No, no, no. I mean no. too many different URLs redirected to exactly just the same page. URL. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's something that we sometimes see where instead of a 404, it's like all of this missing content is redirected to the home page. And that's kind of confusing for users. It doesn't really make sense for us because we can't really equate these pages. So we treat them as soft 404s. Right. But if you took, say, every stock item, a type of t-shirt in uh, every, every time it goes out of season and redirected that back to the category page and that kept happening, you wouldn't consider that. 404, because it's would, just going back to the main. Yeah, okay. that would probably be OK. Yeah. I, I think there is a, a kind of a sliding scale there. If you're like saying, well, these are individual products, and it's a small part of my website, and you're redirecting them to the category page because that fits best, I think that's fine. But if you're saying, well, half of my website is gone, I'm redirecting it to my home page, then of course, that's more of a 404 situation, where actually the website is kind of missing this content now. And the home page isn't really an equivalent replacement for that. Uh, that's interesting because we've, with old sites we've done, I think we've probably made that mistake when we're, f if we're winding down a site and we're folding it up. Sometimes we do, or well, sometimes we'll take the products, fold it into a category, then fold the categories into the home page in the hope that the home page will just become one and then we can throw one that to another. But essentially we could be. 
damaging well, it as we go. No, I mean, you wouldn't be damaging it, because what would happen is we would treat them as 404s, and if you made them 404 yourself, then we would treat them as 404s too. So in, in the worst case scenario, it's essentially the same as if you were putting 404s there directly. Right, but you're not folding up that page rank into via 301s. You're not, OK, yeah, so it's yeah. the wrong way to do a, a slow transgression. Trans you know, folding a business up and then moving it to another site. You shouldn't really fold it up into the home page first, slowly, yeah. and then move it across. OK. Yeah. All right, uh, two affiliate sites from the same manufacturer with the same DA and PR. I think that's a domain authority again. And PageRank, um, both have unique product descriptions, etc. But my site has a lot more unique content, links, etc. The main difference is my site recovered uh, from a manual penalty last year. How can this be? Um, it's really hard to say. I mean, two sites are always pretty different, so it's hard to compare them directly. I don't know exactly what Domain Authority is looking at their uh, page rank. You need to keep in mind that we've stopped updating two of our page rank, I think, two years ago, three years ago, something like that. So those are potentially metrics that are kind of stale and not very useful. So I wouldn't really use that as a way to compare websites directly. Uh, the main difference with one site being having recovered from a manual penalty last year, I guess that's a good thing if you've cleaned up uh, any kind of unnatural links there. Um, but uh, I don't really know what, what the actual question here is, because two websites are, are bound to be very different, and they will appear different in the search results as well. Uh, we do take into account over 200 factors when it comes to crawling, indexing, and ranking. So just because some of those metrics are similar or maybe even exactly the same when you look at the numbers, doesn't mean that we'll show them in rankings exactly the same. Uh, for Google DE, uh, we're seeing widely different results uh, for Feven and Feve, which are like two words for ferry in German. Uh, we understand singular and plural queries have different results, but they can seem very strange. Do you know why this might be? So I guess in general, we don't have, or we generally don't have a kind of semantic model of the languages in that we'll try to understand, oh, this word is this, and this is the plural of this word. And we've looked up in our dictionary and said, this word is a synonym for that. But rather, we try to do this algorithmically, and we try to learn that as we go along. Um, so if we see that people are looking for the same kind of content with like two different words, then we might assume that their synonyms are very similar. On the other hand, if we see that people aren't looking for the same kind of content for words that are very similar looking, then we might assume that they're not synonyms. So I suspect what's happening there is that you're just kind of seeing an effect of how people are searching in German and how maybe they use these words in different uh, contexts, in different ways, in ways that suggest to us or to our automated systems that they're not exact synonyms that we shouldn't be showing exactly the same search results. And that doesn't mean that you need to do anything special. It's just essentially just how users search and how we pick that up. Um, I have a question regarding engagement of a site as a ranking factor. If there are two sites which have the same uh, bounce rate, I guess, uh, do you rank the better one? Do you rank the one better where a user spend more time on a page, click around more, or isn't that considered a ranking factor at all? So we don't use anything from analytics as a ranking factor in search. So from that point of view, that's something that you can kind of skip over. Um, we do sometimes use some information about clicks from search when it comes to analyzing algorithms. So when we try to figure out which of these algorithms are working better, which ones are causing problems, which ones are causing improvements in the search results. That way, that's where we would look into that. But it's not something that you would see on a per site or per page basis. Uh, if you change your site structure, does it uh, take only as long as it takes for Google to recrawl your site in order to get your new ranking positions? Or does Google put a time constraint on things in order to ascertain that nothing else is going to change? Um, 
if you're changing your site within your website, then we do this on a per URL basis, kind of as we go along. So it's not something that we would freeze a site in place, or we would say, well, we're going to drop this site from search until we figure it out again. We go through it on a per URL basis. Some of those will be picked up faster. Some of them take a lot to be recrawled. And uh, essentially, that's kind of a flowing transition from one state to the next one. It's not something where your site should disappear from search and pop back up again. The important part here is, of course, that you do make sure to follow our guideline for site restructuring, that you set up redirects properly so that we can understand this old page is equivalent to this new page. And that's how we should kind of treat that from our side. We sometimes see sites that just delete all of the old and set up a new site. And in those cases, it is really hard to understand what actually is happening here. Because all of the old content, all of the old URLs might be gone, except for the home page. And all of the new content is something that looks different, has different URLs, a different structure on it. So we kind of have to learn all of that from zero again. So as much as possible, make sure that you're following our guidelines for site restructuring, URL changes, so that we can kind of handle that as a flowing transition instead of having to learn everything new again. Uh, in Search Console, uh, from an SKO perspective, what can the crawl stats section tell us, and what should we be looking at to understand how Google perceives one site? Also, oh, are too many internal links either a bad thing? Um, I don't think internal links is really something most sites really have to worry about, unless it's really a situation where we can't crawl to a website. To, to actually find the content. So that might be a problem. But too many internal links, I don't see that as being much of a problem. Um, from the crawl stats, essentially what you want to look for there is that we can crawl your pages in a fairly timely way so that uh, the I think the average time to crawl a URL, I, I forgot what it's called, uh, the, the bottom graph doesn't go too high up, that you're looking at something that's well below a second per URL. So this is not to render the page, to kind of load the page completely, but the individual HTML files or image files or whatever that we're fetching from your server. And I aim definitely for something below a second there. If you can make it happen with like a CDN or a fancy setup going below 100 milliseconds, that's a, a good thing to kind of aim for. Um, the main reason there is that the, the speed that it takes to actually fetch the URLs is one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that we take into account when we determine how fast we can crawl a website. And if we can see that a website is re responding very quickly, we can obviously craw crawl it a lot faster and pick up the new content a lot easier than if a website is really sluggish. And we're not sure if we're going to be able to crawl 1,000 URLs today or cause the server to go down by doing that. So that's kind of one aspect there. It doesn't mean that uh, we'll rank the site lower. But if we can't crawl it, then we can't rank the content. Um, I had a location specific. I had location specific landing pages with unique, rich content, which Google classes as possible doorway pages. Um, I removed them all, and now my rankings have significantly dropped. My site has suffered significantly. Was removing those pages a bad idea? Um, so I suspect if you're saying that Google classified them as possible doorway pages, then you had a manual action on those pages, which means someone from the web spam team took a look at your website and said, well, these are all pages that are essentially targeting the same keywords, that are just funneling people to the same stuff over and over again with different variations of the same keywords, then that's something I'd really clean up. And it might be that your site had unnatural visibility essentially because of those pages, which is why maybe the traffic has dropped after you've removed them. But uh, the manual web time action would have had the same effect as well. So that's something where I'd recommend really making sure that the landing pages that you have provide value of their own, that they're not just city name cleaners and the same content as before, and maybe a scraped Wikipedia image. So that you really have something that's kind of unique to present there. Maybe refine it down to the individual areas instead of city names so that you don't have 
thousands of pages, which are just essentially regenerated content that maybe, I don't know, 10, 20, 50 pages that are targeting specific areas where you do have specific services or products to offer. So that's kind of what I'd recommend there. Um, I really kind of shy away from these doorway pages, kind of these auto-generated pages that essentially are a really bad search experience for our users. Uh, we use rel publisher tag on all pages on our site. Uh, this is linked to Google+, which shows our headquarters address. Should the publisher tag be linked to our other Google Plus pages for our brand pages instead of the main HQ one? Um, I don't know. Uh, this is something you'd probably want to check with the Google Plus uh, folks or with the Google My Business folks if these are your local business pages. Um, I don't know exactly how they handle this kind of situation. Uh, our schema reviews have been removed from the search results by Google. We implemented them. Uh, we had implemented them incorrectly, as we thought Google Shopping would be the same for organic results, so we didn't have them placed on the site. How do we get them back? Um, so, if if they were removed with a manual action, you would see that in the manual action viewer section in Search Console. And once you've cleaned that up, you can do a reconsideration request there, and someone from the team will take a look at that and say, this is good, or this is still problematic, and give you kind of an, a feedback based on that. And if it's from a manual action and the reconsideration request goes through, then over time, that will pop back up again in the search results. Um, on the other hand, if you don't have a manual action for this, then that's something that was kind of algorithmically determined. and. Uh, cleaning that up is a good first step, but it's also something that takes a bit of time because it has to be reprocessed, recrawled, and uh, kind of re reworked on our side to understand that, okay, this site actually implements them properly. We can trust this site to do it right, and our algorithms can just start showing that up again. So it kind of depends on uh, what actually happened there with regards to which direction you need to go. I've noticed that our website has a 302 redirect from the .com to the .co UK for a few months. Has this been passing link juice? Um, so I think there's a big misconception out there about 302s being bad for your website and uh, being bad for your page rank, and your page rank disappears, and you don't pass any value. Uh, and that's definitely not the case. When we recognize a redirect, and we see it's a 302, we'll assume it's a temporary redirect at first, and we'll assume that you want the initial URL index, not the redirection target. And in general, that, that's one thing that we try to do there. However, when we recognize that it's actually more like a permanent redirect, and the 302 is something that you maybe accidentally set up, um, then we do treat that as a 301. And we say, well, instead of indexing the redirecting URL, we'll index the redirection target instead. So it's not a matter of passing page rank or not. Both of these redirects do pass page rank. It's just a matter of which of the URLs we actually show in the search results. Is it the one that is redirecting, which would make sense if it's a temporary redirect? Or is it the one that it's redirecting to, which would make sense if it's a permanent redirect? And we do look at the result, the HTTP code there, if it's a 301 or a 302. But we also try to be smarter about that and try to fix any mistakes that the webmaster might have made there. Uh, is there any chance we can do a site clinic hangout? Yes, we can definitely do that again. Um, they always take a lot more time, so I try to find a, a bit of time when, when time frame when I have a little bit more time to actually go through all of these sites. But uh, it's definitely on my mind as well. Uh, we're considering implementing HTTPS, but wanted to find out if we get hurt by having to redirect our existing HTTP links to HTTPS version of our site. Uh, when you redirect a link, you lose a little bit of value, right? Um, it is true that there's a very small bit of uh, value that kind of gets lost with a HTTP, with a, any kind of a redirect there. But if you're doing this within your website, that's not something you really need to worry about. So if you're redirecting from HTTP to HTTPS, then that's definitely not something that I would kind of see as 
holding me back from moving to a secure protocol to kind of making my site a little bit secure for my users. So that's definitely not something where you'd expect to see any kind of a visible change, or you might say, well, my site has dropped in ranking because I redirected it. That's definitely not going to happen. Uh, we notice a lot of 301, 301, 301 uh, 200 uh, status codes on our website instead of just one occurrence of a 301. Uh, does this directly impact our rankings? Do you lose double the amount of link juice passed because there are three, 302 301s? Uh, no, that's perfectly fine. I mean, we follow those kind of redirects, and we recognize your final destination page, and that's perfectly fine. I would make sure that you're not doing more than five redirects in one go, um, but in general, that's not something that I've seen people do. So if, if you have two redirects there, that's, that's perfectly normal. Sometimes that's also an effect of how the site is set up, that maybe there's a redirect from the non dub dub to the dub 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 version, and on the dub 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 version, there's a redirect to the actual new URL. And those are very common setups, and that's not something that would cause any problem for yourself. Yeah, uh, John. Regarding this question, regarding this question, mm -hmm. uh, at, at this uh, user has asked for three hundred one to three hundred one to two hundred. But I think there would be any issue if three hundred one goes to three hundred two, and then three hundred two goes to two hundred. So, in terms of passing page uh, page link juice, uh, is there any issue if there is one three hundred two between this? No. No, that's that's perfectly fine. I I think that's also the kind of situation where we try to figure out what the webmaster is trying to do and just try to do that for them directly. So mm -hmm. I I've never seen any situation where you have a combination of three hundred one and three hundred two that would cause any problem on our side. Okay. Um, we've seen lots of discussions about creating good content, adding value, fixing duplicate content, et cetera. Um, but what does a content mean based on the different nature of websites? I see people creating lots of text, which is really never even read. So that's that's a good point. Yeah, it's not it's not the case that we say your website should have a lot of text. Um, a, with content, we essentially mean what you're providing on your website, which could be a service, which could be information, which could be a tool. It could be something that is, is based on images, and there's absolutely no text at all on a page. And that's really something that you have to work out yourself what you want to provide on your website so that users go to your website. And it's definitely not that you need to generate a big block of text in order to be seen in search. Uh, sometimes a little bit of text and uh, a fancy game or something like that can be really effective. Um, how should I treat out of stock product pages? Should I show a custom 404, a 410, or 301 to the category page? Um, we talked about this with Rob in the beginning. And essentially, it, it kind of depends on the, the individual situation there. Um, so, uh, so for example, if if it's individual products that are going out of stock and the category page has good replacements, then maybe it makes sense to redirect to that. If it's individual products that are going out of stock and you have another replacement that you can use uh, instead of that product. Maybe that's a good replacement there as well, and you could 301 to that. On the other hand, if these are products that are going out of stock and the category page is really kind of unrelated to that, then maybe just returning a 404 is perfectly fine. I wouldn't worry so much about the difference between 404 and 410 in a situation like that. We do process 410s a tiny bit faster, but in practice, that's not going to have any effect on your website. So I wouldn't lose any sleep on whether or not I should use 401 or uh, 404 or 410. Uh, they're very, very similar on us. But with regards to redirecting to a different product or a category page, that's something you kind of have to look at on a, on a per page or per product basis and think about how equivalent is this new page actually to the old page. 
And in the worst case, what will happen is we'll see that as a soft 404, and we'll say, well, they're redirecting 500 products to a category page, and the category page is totally unrelated. So we assume that this is meant to be a 404, and we'll treat it as a 404, which means we, we don't pass any page rank to the category page, but essentially it's the same as if you did the right thing from the start. So our algorithms are trying to figure out what you mean and make sure that that actually happens. Uh, there's a Google My Business profile on a location where we no longer operate. However, it still says we have a location here on our brand name. Uh, we don't own this listing and want to delete it. How can we remove it? Um, I don't know. You'd have to check with the Google My Business folks. It might be that you can do something through MapMaker, depending on where you're located, if MapMaker is act active there. Um, but I really double check with the Google My Business or the Maps folks to, to see what can be done there. Uh, what carries more weight with regards to affecting rankings, Panda or Penguin, or the 200 other factors that you have? Um, everything. Everything has a lot of weight. It really depends on, on what's happening. It's not that we say this factor is the only thing that applies, or this factor is the only thing that applies. Uh, sometimes we of noise, Gary. Uh, sometimes we recognize that people are looking for something new, and we'll try to show something new. And then maybe a week later, we'll recognize that, oh, for this query, they're not looking for anything new anymore. They want the reference work that was put online 10 years ago. So th these are things that change all the time. It's not one single factor that, uh, that affects all of the search results and that you need to focus on to fix everything and to rank number one. Um, do internal server errors with a 500 impact my ranking? Yes, they can. Um, so there are two aspects there. On the one hand, server errors are a sign for us that maybe we're crawling your website too quickly, that maybe we're causing problems on your server, so we'll pack off with the crawl rate a little bit when we see 500 errors. On the other hand, we see 500 errors when they persist as being kind of like a 404 in that we'll have to drop those URLs from the search results because we think maybe these URLs uh, don't work for users either. So those are kind of the two aspects there. It's not that a site would get penalized for having server errors. We just wouldn't crawl it as quickly. And we drop those individual URLs that are returning server errors persistently. Um, the second part of the question goes on. In uh, Search Console, my site is having a larger number of internal server errors, which are actually pages which I blocked using no index, no follow tags. How can I fix that? Um, so. If these pages are blocked with no index, no follow tags, then we wouldn't see that if we see a 500 server error. And uh, for those individual pages, if we drop them because they have a 500 or if we drop them because they have a no index, it's essentially kind of the same. But the effect that you will see still in, in a case like this is that we will try to crawl a little bit slower because we think maybe we're the reason why your server is returning these server errors. And we don't want to kind of be uh, rude for your website and crawl it stronger than it can actually take. So fixing that, one thing I try to do is figure out why your server is returning 500 errors for those pages. And maybe you can just have it return uh, the normal search result, the normal page with the no index tag so that we can learn to drop that. Maybe you can just return a 404 and tell us, well, these pages don't really don't need to be crawled and indexed, and we'll, ref we'll respect that as well. Uh, does changing the title tag too often uh, affect the overall rankings of a page? For example, I changed the page title to better match the search queries that I want to rank for. However, this resulted in a drop in rankings. I changed it back, but it never recovered. Um, so I think we do take the title tag into account when it comes to ranking, but we do primarily also use that uh, for the, the title in the search results. So if someone sees your search result in, in their, or your entry in their search results, they'll understand what this page is about and understand that this might be relevant to them or might not be relevant to them. 
Um, and if you've changed that, that shouldn't really be a problem. So if you're just changing your title tags and you see a significant drop in ranking, then that wouldn't be related to your title tags. Uh, on a travel site, does it make sense to prioritize uh, the site structure, the products where we add the most value and unique content to accommodations easier to reach by Googlebot because we know these accommodations will be available on many other sites. Um, so let me try to parse this question properly. Um, so I think what, what he's asking is, should we move the content where we have something unique and valuable into a more visible place on our website uh, with regards to site structure, maybe links from the home page, those kind of things. And in general, that's something I'd, I'd really go for. If these are pages where you think you're providing a lot of value, where you also see that users love these pages, then I try to put them in a more visible place. I think that's a, a logical thing to do. It does help us to better understand that these pages are more, more important for your website as well if we see that they're linked from the home page, for example. So if these are really important topics, if these are maybe destinations where you're saying, well, I have a lot of knowledge here, and I really want to make sure that anyone who goes to my website knows that there's some really great content here that they can take a look at, then that's something I'd, I'd aim to do. I, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. That's not something where I'd kind of artificially hide the, the nice and great stuff that I have there. Uh, oh, well, updating the robot's text file in Webmaster Tools isn't clear. It simply says submit and makes it seem like a test submit, not a request to update and pull the latest one. Um, that's good feedback. I'll, I'll double check with the team on, on that. So essentially, updating the robots text file there, the idea is you can try it out in Search Console to see if it matches what you're trying to do. And then you still have to download it, put it on your server, and uh, we'll pick it up again. So what generally happens there is we'll crawl the robots text file about once a day for a website. And if it changes, then we'll take that into account. But obviously, if you update your robots text file maybe 10 minutes after we've looked at it already, then it'll take up to a day for us to actually take that into account. And the submit feature in Search Console tells us we need to check this out a lot faster. So we'll go and crawl the current robots text file a lot quicker um, after you've submitted it there, because we think, well, if you've taken the time to update it and to let us know that you've updated it, we need to reflect that a lot faster. Hey, John, can I ask you um, uh, uh, how are you doing? Nice to see you again. Been a while. <laughs> um, a quick question is, um, I'm actually doing a huge culling of our site. So we've currently got 10,000 pages on the site, and I'm dropping it down to 1,000. I'm actually removing 9,000 pages of content to do with office space. And um, so what I'm doing right now is I've gone in and I've put a bunch of URLs in the URL removal tool. And uh, hopefully that's going to remove all of the culprit pages that I want gone. And then from there, um, I read that I also have to have things in a robot.txt file uh, in order for that to sort of block the process and make it do what I want. Um, what kind of time frame am I looking at on, uh, in terms of seeing those URLs being removed from Google? I have no index and no followed all the pages also. OK. So you need to make sure that you're not combining robots text with no index, because if they're blocked by robots text, we don't see the no index. So I let them crawlable and just have the no index there. I think we're working on updating the documentation there to make that a little bit clearer, because that's a common mistake that we see. Um, with the URL removal tool, you should see those effects within less than a day, about. But one thing to keep in mind with the URL removal tool is it removes these results from the search results. It doesn't remove them from our index directly. So the, the subtle difference there is that uh, when the, the removal request expires and that URL is still in our index, because maybe it doesn't have a no index at that time or whatever, then it might show up again. I think that's 90 days, something like that. 
in but if general, they have been no indexed already. Yeah, if, if they have been no indexed, then that should be perfectly enough time for us to actually recrawl those and recognize that they're no index and remove them completely from our index. So the so, URL removal tool kind of speeds things up in that they won't be shown in search. And during those 90 days, we have a little bit of time to actually recrawl those pages and see, well, there's a no index here, so we can remove it completely for the long run. And are you saying then I shouldn't be using the robot.txt file to, to block those at the moment? Exactly. OK, because the documentation, I only just did that about 20 minutes ago. The documentation all over the forums and everything says that they, and this is official webmaster stuff, says that they do need to be used in conjunction. It actually gave me a step-by-step -step guide to do exactly that. And I'll send you some links in an email just so that you can, sure. you can yeah, see that's, that. That's good. So there are some confusing differences there in that we have one version of the tool for webmasters, and which is in Search Console, and another version for normal users. And for the normal user tool, you can use the robots text file to let us know that this page is kind of gone. Uh, for webmasters, they need to kind of follow the normal steps that are necessary for like an organic update of the website through the no index and all of that. Okay. And the final part to that is that I'm actually doing taking into account one of the things that you were saying about combining content. So instead of having 20 pages with a small bit on each page, I'm piling them all into one page and reducing everything down to a couple of hundred pages at the most. Now, I don't want to submit those new pages to Google until the others have been removed so that that, that old content isn't, that's being reintroduced isn't kind of duplicated content from the site. I'm not sure if it makes any sense for me to do it in this order. I was kind of under the impression once the content is removed, the index kind of forgets about that content, and then I can kind of reintroduce it as new content. But that's just kind of where my brain's at. Is there any sense to that? I don't think you need to do that. I think you can just go ahead and put your new content up. And even if the old content is still live in the search results, that shouldn't be a problem, uh, primarily because these pages aren't one-to-one -one copies. It's like individual blocks of text might be the same there. But it's not the case that you have exact copies of the same content there that we would pick one and kind of hide the other one. Um, so in a case like that, I would have no trouble just saying, well, put it all online and take the other ones down, do it this order or do it the other order. It's really up to you. Yeah, because the concept is really Panda and how it looks at content, essentially, and making sure that it looks at our site in a totally different way now. I don't think you need to do anything special with regards to the order there. Amazing. Uh, Thanks, John. Okay. John, can I can I just ask something else based on that? Sure. So during that, let's say it is ninety days, if you've removed a page from the index, that page that is still sitting in your servers, um, is that still passing all the relevant authority and or penalties or anything else, even though you'd never see it if you Googled it? it's still sitting there and giving a signal to the rest of the the pages it's, it may still link to, et cetera. It's just an invisible. Yeah, yeah. OK. So I mean, it's, it's similar. I mean, essentially what happens is we have this page in an index. And when we put the search results together for a specific query, we double check if this is like on, on that list of the urgent removals. And if it's on that list, we won't show it in the search results. So it's kind of in our system still normally. It can be processed normally. It, the links pass value normally. But we just don't show it in the search results. So you would still, if you're looking at another related page, you could still see that hidden one in a link report. And that might be a bit confusing to people Oh, saying, definitely. Oh, yeah. yeah. You'll okay. definitely still see that. Right. I mean, you can also see situations where you have a page that has a no index, but that has links on it that do pass page rank. So that's kind of a similar situation there, except that in, with a no index, of course, you can double check the headers and see, oh, it has a no index. That's why it's not showing. And if it's with the urgent removal tool, then you don't really see that as a, as a site owner or a person who's just like randomly looking for that URL. OK. 
And this week's Ajax announcement was a bit vague. Care to rephrase? Oh, man, we worked so long on this blog post. Now it's vague. Um, so I think that the biggest aspect here is really that we're working on really rendering as many pages as possible. And in a lot of times, uh, people were using the Ajax crawling scheme as a way to say, well, Google can't really crawl my pages properly. Therefore, I'll try to do it for them uh, with the Ajax crawling scheme. And we'll try to do it like that. And we just want to say that this is no longer necessary. If you have a normal website that uses JavaScript to create your content, you don't really need to use the Ajax crawling scheme anymore. We can pretty much crawl and process um, most types of JavaScript setups, uh, most type of JavaScript-based sites, and we can pick that up directly for our index. So that's essentially what the, this announcement was, that we're not recommending the Ajax crawling um, set up anymore. Uh, we're still going to respect those URLs. We'll still be able to crawl and index those URLs like that. Um, but in the future, we recommend that you just like either do pre-rendering directly in the sense that users and uh, search engines would see a pre-rendered page, uh, which is something that there are also a number of third-party services out there that do this for you. Um, or just use JavaScript directly as you have it, and in general, we'll be able to pick that up. You can double check that with uh, the Fetch and Render tool in Search Console. And that essentially gives you a good idea of what Googlebot is able to pick up when it does render the page. And there are probably going to be individual parts where we don't pick up everything perfectly uh, just yet. I think that's kind of normal. That's something we're always working on improving. If you do see that for your specific JavaScript framework or your setup that you have there, we can't pick it up properly, then I'd first check to make sure that the JavaScript runs properly, that you don't have any JavaScript errors in there. Because if the JavaScript crashes when we try to render the page, then like any browser, we won't be able to render the page properly. Uh, finally, if uh, all of the files are actually accessible for us, so we see a lot of situations where JavaScript files are blocked by robots text, or server responses are blocked by robots text. And if that's the case, we can't see the content. And you'll see that flagged in the Fetch and Render tool in Search Console, for example. And if that still doesn't help, if it still looks like Googlebot isn't able to pick up your content properly, then by all means, do post in our help forum so that we can take a look at that, pass it on to the engineers, and get that improved, because that's something we do want to improve over time to make sure that it actually does work for as many frameworks as possible. John, can I step uh, in with a question? Sure. Um, the problem here, uh, I mean, not a problem, but anyway, um, how about we are using JavaScript to um, serve the content faster to the clients, you know, to the visitors? Mm -hmm. And Google comes and see the normal URLs and the Java URLs. Uh, is that in somehow considered duplicate, duplicate content? No. I mean, we'll process the JavaScript as well. And if we see the final version on the page, that's perfectly fine. If you use separate URLs for JavaScript and for Googlebot, then I think you might run into problems, because we don't really know how to fold those URLs together. But for the most part, we see websites use JavaScript on their normal URLs to add additional functionality, for example, or to kind of do lazy loading, those kind of things. And all of that is perfectly fine and shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, we don't hide content uh, from Google, and we don't serve Google other content than uh, the normal uh, users. But we just use the JavaScript because from a point of view, it will only change the products on a page and doesn't stay to load all the designs and stuff, you know? And that's mm -hmm. a very fast serving for the clients. That's, that sounds good. I wouldn't worry about that. OK. Thank you. Yeah, John. Uh, Ooh, I can't hear you. There was one one problem I was facing. Hello. Can you repeat the question? 
one page go uh, just or maybe if you can type it into the chat on the uh, ajax scrolling i i can barely hear you um oh. Okay. Maybe if you can type it into the chat, I'll, I'll pick it up from there. I am thinking. Oh. Okay, I'll wait for your question in the chat and go through some of the next ones here very briefly. Uh, what are some, some ways small businesses can get ahead in search engines and gain more exposure to the websites? Ooh, um, that's a big topic. Um, so one thing that that I think I, I think there are two things that I see a lot of small businesses, um, especially local small businesses, make mistakes. On the one hand, they don't explain exactly what they, what it is that they're offering on their website, so it's really hard for search engines to understand where we should be showing this content. On the other hand, uh, one thing that I frequently see is that sites try to be the same as other big sites, in that uh, maybe a local bookstore tries to position itself as being kind of like Amazon and that it has all the books that you can possibly read, but at the same time, of course, they're not Amazon. It's, it's a very different business, and they have very unique selling propositions of their own, but those USPs aren't really directly visible on their website. So really making it clear what it is that you're offering, what it is that search engines should be showing to you, uh, your website to other users for, and trying to find a little niche of your own where you can say, well, I'm a fantastic expert in this kind of book, for example, or this kind of uh, product, or I am the only person in this region who has this to offer kind of this uh, unique value that you're providing, making clear that that's visible directly as well. All right, uh, let me just check the question from the chat. I want to index my page without the hash bang and my company even not giving any HTML sn snapshot to search engines. So after yesterday's announcement, should I work on server delivery for an HTML snapshot or what? So the first thing that needs to happen is we need to have individual URLs. So if you have the current URLs with the hash bang, um, then that's something you might want to migrate to a cleaner, like normal looking URL structure using HTML5, push state, for example, as a way to um, navigate using JavaScript within a website. So that's probably a fairly big step that, that needs to be done at some point. And then with regards to serving HTML snapshots or not, I think that's something you probably want to look at in a second step. Or if you're doing that at the same time, use the Fetch and Render tool in Search Console to see how Google is able to pick up the content without the HTML snapshot. And um, maybe also double check to see where else you need to have your pages visible. If you're using a special social network that you need to have your content visible in, then double check to see that they can pick up the right content from those pages as well. And if you need to use HTML snapshots or pre-rendering for any of those pages or any of the places where you want your content shown, then Google will be able to, to use that as well. But it's it's a hard question yeah, John, to answer. Actually, uh, I have done fetch as Google board, and it, oh, <laughs> actually, I was even thinking to work on this issue. Oh, you're breaking up. I can hardly hear oh. you. Oh, let me type it. Um, fetches Google, yeah. So fetches Google doesn't work for hash, hash bang pages directly. You need to fetch the escape fragment version there. So that's if you have URLs that have a normal URL structure, then fetches Google will work for that. Um, so that's something that that you could be doing there to kind of try, try things out. Uh, 
Um, is it possible to circumvent the wait time between making a change and Google crawling your site by social presence? It seems it ought to make sense uh, that higher traffic might trigger a crawl. Um, so what I recommend doing there is using maybe something like the sitemap file to let us know that these pages have changed, give us a new change date in the sitemap file. You can also use the uh, fetches Google and submit to indexing tool in Search Console to let us know about that. Um, I, in general, I don't think we use social networks to kind of uh, speed up the recrawling of changed uh, content, primarily because those links tend to have a nofollow attached to them. So we wouldn't even like notice that we'd have to recrawl those pages. So that's something where I think social networks is probably a very, very indirect way of letting us know that this content has changed. Uh, there's a question here about iOS app indexing. I really recommend going to the help forum about that, because I don't know the details of how that's handled on iOS at the moment. But uh, I know we have some people looking at the forums with regards to app indexing questions, and they should be able to kind of help you resolve that. Uh, what's the difference between the Google index and the Google bot? How does it affect the search results? So Googlebot is essentially the crawler that we send out to the web to crawl the individual pages. Um, and the Google index is essentially where we store those individual pages when we have crawled them. So Googlebot takes the content from the web and passes it on to the Google index. And then the Google index is used as a basis for the Google search results. Um, let's see. Lots of questions left. Let me try to pick some. Uh, there's a question about misconceptions. We could probably do a big hangout on that uh, completely. Uh, my site is reporting 55 pages with mobile usability issues. However, when I test the pages individually, they report as mobile friendly. Um, how long does it take? Well, we generally recrawl these pages regularly. And uh, depending on how big your website is, it might be that we recrawl them every couple of days. So this report will refresh very quickly. It might be that there are pages within your website that take up to half a year to be recrawled, which might be these 55 pages that are kind of lingering along there. But that's generally not something I'd, I'd really worry about there. If you want to speed that up, you can use the fetch and submit to indexing tool um, in Search Console. Um, I understand a new GTLD is becoming available, .law. Just as you have to prove you're an educator to get in .edu, you have to have a law license to get a .law. Do you see this, uh, that this will affect the trust factor of a domain on .law? Um, from our point of view, no. Uh, we would at least initially treat these as any other generic topic. Okay, I don't really worry about that. And if you want to speed that up, you can use the fetch and submit to indexing tool. Uh, um, so if this is a new top level domain and you have very strict requirements, that we would still treat it as a, any other generic top level domain that we would run across. And potentially over time, if we recognize that these domains on this top level domain are really, really different and need to be treated in a different way, then that's something that we might be able to take into account. But that's definitely not something that I would count on. I mean, even with .edu, where you have to prove that you're an educator, we see a lot of spam on .edu. We see a lot of hacked sites on .edu. We see a lot of uh, pharmaceutical advertisements that are placed there by I don't know who, uh, on that .edu site. So we can't really say that .edu is like a step above everything else just because uh, it has some requirements to get the domain name. So that's something where, theoretically, we could take that into account if we recognize over time that this content is really, really significantly different. And it makes sense for our relevance algorithms to treat it differently. But uh, at least initially, we're going to treat that as any other generic top-level domain, 
And of course, these domains have a chance to become really relevant and really fantastic websites. They're not held back by anything. It's just that we're not giving any special bonus out just because you're using uh, something like a dot law or another uh, GTLD that has specific requirements behind it. All right, we still have a bunch of questions left, but I bet you here in the Hangout still have questions too. So let me just uh, open it up for you guys. What's what's on your mind? What can I help uh, with? John, can I <laughs> tell you sure. one more thing? Um, when we use multiple entity schema markups, um, Google Search Console show all the properties marked up twice. This is a problem in interpreting, or is just a uh, uh, renderer problem? I don't know. So you're using multiple types of markup for the same content, or? Yeah, it's uh, multiple entities. I will show you an example right now in chat. So it's like multiple things on the same HTML page, something like that? Uh, it's a uh, entity declaration which use multiple entities. I mean, I can use a product okay. and the residence in the same time. In this case, uh, Google Console shows all the properties twice, like once it's parsing for product and the other time it's parsing for residence. Yeah, that's I think that's normal. That's, that should be fine. OK, and the second problem is uh, that the structured data testing tool is having a bug, and it doesn't recognize multiple entities, although Google Console sees them. The problem is we are not able to verify the correctitude of the implementation prior to uploading on the website because of this bug. OK. Um, I'd love to have an example. So okay. if you can send me a, some example URLs, I, I'd love to take a look at that with the, the structured data testing tool people, because I know they're pretty responsive with regards to changes and bugs. So that's something where I suspect they'll be happy to Fix okay. Something. Thank you very much. I will send you three email uh, detailed example. All right. Thank you. Great. Hey John, uh, there's a recent uh, report that shows that uh, the, uh, there's a lower correlation of links to a ranking uh, this year versus last year. Is it something that uh, might be true? You're you're putting less emphasis or on the number of things, or maybe on the anchor text, something like that, or you're trying to go that route? I don't know. I haven't seen that report. I don't know where where that came from. Um, it's I don't think anything significantly is changing there, in the sense that. We like drop links completely. I don't think that's happened. No, but I mean, is, is it something? Is it maybe a goal of the algorithm relying less and less on on links or, or on the anchor text? Is it something that you're trying to do going forward? Maybe you rely more on other factors. I don't know. I mean, we we always make changes in search, and uh, I think depending on the factors that we're working on that we see are very promising to make the search more changing relevant. there. Um, we, we do make changes there. So I would expect to see various reports saying, well, Google search is changing. And maybe it's changing this direction now. Maybe it changes in another direction next week. Uh, we're like, constantly working on improving things. So that's something where. I don't know what that specific report is looking at or what they're picking up on, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, reports found things are different. Right. And uh, really quickly, is there any news regarding the Penguin update? Regarding what? The Penguin update. The Penguin update. I don't have anything new on that to share at the moment. OK, cool. All right, more questions from you all here in the Hangout, if you have anything on your mind. Um, hello? Hey. Hi. Yeah, um, I just want to ask, in order to have a knowledge graph for either person or place, what are the things that we need to consider in doing that? I mean, for knowledge graph, either 
extracted from our website or from Wikipedia, and for how long? I mean, how long can we have that kind of result? Um, so the knowledge graph is generated completely algorithmically. It does use things like structured data on a website uh, to kind of extract information from a website to show that. But it's not something that you can control as a webmaster, per se, because we do try to look at the information from multiple sources and figure out which of these aspects are actually real information and which of these aspects might be just something from one individual source on the web. And who knows if we can trust that source. So that's something where we, we try to look at things overall. We use the structured data markup on the pages to, to pick that up. But we can't guarantee that we'll be able to use that all the time or uh, right away for, from any specific website. So using structured markup is a great way to help us there, but it's not a guarantee that we can use that for the knowledge graph. OK, cool. Thanks. Sure. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hi. Hello? Hello? Hi, Don? Ah, hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, I'm here. Hey, finally. Um, I had a quick question about um, something that Gary said at PubCon last week in his closing keynote speech. He was talking about um, no indexing thin content uh, rather than trying to remove it, obviously, to avoid any sort of panda-related issues. And he said to also add it to the XML sitemap. My only concern really was that, is that not a waste of crawl budget, so to speak? Um, when you add it, it to the XML, leave it there. So adding it to the sitemap makes sense as a temporary way to kind of speed things up for the recrawling. So if you put a noindex tag on a page and we would recrawl that page every six months, for example, then it takes a while, quite a long time for us to notice that there's a noindex there. And by putting that URL into the sitemap, you're saying, well, this URL changed, and we'll try to recrawl it a little bit faster. We'll see that there's a noindex there, and we'll drop it a little bit faster. And at that point, you can remove it from the sitemap. You don't need to keep it there. So it's kind of like you put it temporarily into the sitemap, maybe for a week or two, and then you take it out when you say, well, it's really gone for good now. Google doesn't need to crawl it anymore. They don't really need to worry about it anymore. OK, that's brilliant. Can I, can I ask one other quick question as well? Sure. A few weeks ago, you mentioned about canonicalization. My understanding of canonicalization has been that it's always got to be a near exact duplicate of a page. So when you end up with things like .html, .php, you know, variations of the same exact output. Um, but recently, you mentioned that you can canonicalize to pages that have the same sort of value, if you like. So is it OK if you've got very, very thin subcategory pages on a site that ended up, I, I've got a site that ended up with an infinite U, uh, URL, and it just spiraled out of control, and we ended up with like one and a half million index pages. <clears throat> crawl, crawl, crawl. Crawler stats just went through the floor over time. Mm -hmm. They've been trying to pull it back for quite a long time. So it occurred to me if we've got very thin subcategory pages on mass, can, can we can canonicalize to a content rich category and add a no index as well? Or, or would you just do one or the other? Yeah, I try to do one or the other. Um, the difficulty with having a no index on like one pair of a canonical page uh, set is that we don't really know exactly what you mean with that. So one page can be indexed, but has a rel canonical pointing to another page that has a no index tag on it. Um, they're very different pages because this one can't be indexed, this one can be indexed, but you're saying they're equivalent, so we don't really know what to do there. So what generally happens is we'll ignore the rel canonical and just keep that one page indexed. So if you have both of the pages no index, then that's, that's fine. Then you don't really need a rel canonical between those pages. Um, if you say this is a one page that kind of replaces these individual pages, then having a rel canonical pointing at that one page would be fine. But in a case like that, I try to avoid like having one of them have a no index and one of them not. 
So best to have the no index, submit to XML sitemap, and then remove, and just sure. take out the rel canonicals. That sounds good, yeah. Okay, because over time we'll Google, Googlebot begin to not trust the, any rel canonicals you put on if you start to get a bit silly with it. Um, it's really rare. It's really rare that that happens. So we sometimes see cases where people have a rel canonical pointing at their home page, and they put that across the whole website. And obviously, that's something we can recognize and say, well, this is clearly wrong. We should be ignoring that. But if you're messing around with a rel canonical and you have some things to category page, some things here, then that's probably not something where we'd say, well, we can't trust a rel canonical at all on this site. OK. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave sure. now so somebody else can jump in. Thanks, John. Cheers. Thanks. Uh, John, we got the world canonical. I assume uh, uh, it's a pretty bad idea for uh, kind of putting world canonical on pagination pages to the main. Uh, so if you have a category with a lot of pages, I've seen that some CMSs simply use a world canonical from those pagination pages to the main page of the category. So page two, three, four, five of the category have a rel canonical to the main page. I assume this is a pretty bad idea. They should probably use a rel next prep or just the index page two and pop rather than just a use canonical. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think for paginated sets like that, I aim to use like the rel next, rel previous. Um, I don't think it's going to like cause any big problems with the rel canonical, uh, provided we can still crawl to the individual pages that are linked. So, for example, if you have a set of paginated pages and they point to individual products, and on page five there's a link to this one product that we don't see anywhere else on the website, if you always have the rel canonical pointing to the first set of that set, then we won't find that link to that individual product. But if we can crawl the website normally and we can see the rest of the content, then it's it should be fine. I, I wouldn't really worry about that. I wouldn't treat that as a critical issue on a website. OK, but there are some cases where you might just not find uh, certain products, let's say, because you know there's a lot of article there, so you're go just going to see the main category page. And you might never call those products if those products aren't accessible from yeah. somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, theoretically, that can happen. I think in practice, most websites have a strong enough mesh across the whole website that from one product you can get to any other one by clicking long enough, even if you don't go through like a paginated set. But uh, theoretically, that that could be a situation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, we're kind of over time. Um, the next Hangout, I think, is in two weeks, something like that, which will be at a more US-friendly time. So Kristen, I think that'll be easier for you. Um, and after that, we should be getting back to a kind of more regular schedule as well. Um, so thank you all for joining. I hope this was useful. Lots of really good questions here, lots of good discussions. And uh, I wish you all a great weekend. And maybe I'll see you again in one of the future Hangouts. Bye, Thanks, John. Nice to see you.